come here really does kind of fit into one of the... I am so glad to be back home. I've been in California now for off and on. I've been back home since I've been there uh, full time. For about 20 years, um, I went out to uh, pursue a career in movie directing and television, things like that. And I managed to get some success in, in all those areas. Um, I lived off of options for a long time. Um, I would just write um, nice treatments of things that I was imagining or dreaming. And I would send it out to agents, and they'd say, um, yeah, we'll option that. And, you know, they'd send me some money. So, wow, this is a really nice way to make a living. I just, you know, I sit down and, you know, take about an hour or so and dream up something new and send it out, and they'd option it. And I thought, wow. And I never got a production. But I had plenty of option money. Huh? This is really cool. So, anyway, I went, I, I was, just reminiscing over my time uh, in, at A&M, and I was thinking, oh my God, it's been 40 years I, since I enrolled at Texas A&M. I walked onto the campus after I'd already had a music career, and I decided I just didn't want to do that anymore. I was um, over the hill. I was 22. So, <laughs> So I decided to do what Big Mama always told me to do. She said, you know, you always have to have something to fall back on and in case that dream doesn't come true. Well, the dream did come true. I was able to do some recording. I traveled with some major bands, but it just got to be too much. And I wanted to be able to have a normal life. And I didn't manage to do that, but <laughs> I'm still striving to have a normal life. But I've had a good career, and I think that Texas A&M and my whole Brazos Valley experience prepared me for that. It prepared me in ways that I, can't, I could not imagine at that time, and I cannot even explain today. Um, the things that I learned, not just from my family, but from the communities around me. And then uh, culminating with my degree at Texas A&M, it's just meant so much to me personally and professionally. And my book, uh, Big Mama Didn't Shop at Woolworths, came from uh, a column, a tiny little column that I used to write for the Bryan College Station Eagle back in the early 90s. And it got some attention from the Houston Chronicle. And I thought, what do they want? They called me and wanted an interview and wanted me to do a column for them. And I thought, how cool is that? And so I went to uh, have the interview with a guy named Tony Peterson, who was the publisher of the Chronicle at that time. By the way, my editor at um, the Eagle was Diane Bowen. She was very, she was so far ahead of her time. She said, history is as important, if not more important, than news. She said, as a historian, you sit down and you tell a story that happened a century ago like it's happening right now. She said, and if you can do that, you can sell it. And I thought, no way. But it was true. Because my column in the Bryan College Station Eagle was about, it was a small story about my life with my grandmother. Who would be interested in that? Well, we, <laughs> we got so much mail as a result of that little column that the Eagle didn't know what to do with it all. And I couldn't read it all. So I got my mother involved with her friends and they clipped and they read and they answered all the mail. And then I started writing for the Chronicle and mail started coming in from other places. And then there was a syndication company in New York that wanted to syndicate my little column about life in the Brazos Valley years ago with my grandmother. And I had mail coming in from all over the world, commenting on, about, on life in the Brazos Valley. 
It was astonishing to me that anyone would be interested in my little story, my little life, my little community. But people made me realize that it was more than my little story, my little life, my little family, my little community. It was, it was a universal story because it was a story about family and community. And I tried really hard to cover as many aspects of the community in my column as I could. Once the column had been nationally syndicated, Texas A&M University Press sent um, a representative to see me, and they wanted to know if I wanted to collect these in a book. And I thought, duh, <laughs> who wouldn't? It's like a book that wrote itself. And that's not true, though. <laughs> it was a lot of work to be done to make it a book. But I told them yes, and they sent me, gave me a contract, and they even gave me an advance, which I immediately spent. And so I had to do the book because the money was gone and I couldn't pay it back. But anyway, we got this book together. Big Mama didn't shop at Woolworths, and it was a culmination of a whole life and experience, and it's, it's a memoir. It's about me and my family and my community over the course of my early childhood. I finish it off at about junior high school. I just, it was just too much. I couldn't go any farther than that. But it has gotten me so much attention nationally that that's what I was writing my little treatments about and people were paying me money to option them. So <laughs> one story, as a matter of fact, was a story about Iola. And several other stories were about College Station. They were mostly about Bryan and College Station, but I did hit some of the um, outlying um, uh, counties of the Brazos Valley as well. But um, one family that I, that I covered quite a bit was the Peterson family, the family that Linda was just talking about. They were one of the first African-American families to own land in what has become College Station. They came here uh, during the Civil War. Uh, the, the gentleman, Ned Peterson Sr., was from Virginia, and he picked up his wife in Alabama, and they rode a horse to Texas. And they ended up in Wilmore, of all places, but that's where they ended up. And they were able to buy land. They were able to do business. They were able to become part of the community. And at the time when they came, they were, I, I guess you could say they were colorless because they were treated like anybody else. They went about their business. They raised their kids. They did what they had to do. Although there were areas of their life that were segregated, they still were able to flourish as a family. And so the community embraced that because they were uh, of a certain caliber of people who wanted to do something and who were trying to do something. And they managed to um, build a small empire in Welburn. They bought hundreds of acres of land near White Creek and uh, the Brazos River. And they um, raise kids. They've got four, five generations of Peterson children now, who some still live in College Station. And I was able to work with the archaeological laboratory at Texas A&M's uh, archaeology department in the early 90s. And I did all of the photo re reproductions and all of the document reproductions, and I did oral histories of these descendants. And that is the exhibit that Brazos Valley Speaks is going to make possible for the 75th anniversary of College Station as a way of helping College Station to celebrate its history, and a lot of this history is unknown because as soon as the project finished, they just sent it in to the state of Texas. It got cataloged someplace, and it's in a drawer somewhere. And all those, those documents are just unknown. 
And so I was talking with um, Ann Preston and my committee, Wayne Sadbury's on the committee, Pat Cleary, um, Bill Watkins, I don't think he's here today. But anyway, we were talking about it and they said, well, that would be a perfect way to help College Station celebrate its anniversary, 75th anniversary, is to let share this history with them. And so we went about putting together all of the photographs and the documents, and it, it's really much bigger than we thought it was going to be. Um, it's it's um, several photographs of 20, 30 photographs, documents, uh, books that we've accumulated over the course of the, the study that have been bound. And so all of that's going to be available so that people can actually see what was going on right here all those years ago. And so I'm really proud to be a part of, a part of that. And in my work in California, I do similar things. Um, I had a chance to work with a group that was um, documenting the Tuskegee Airmen. And we started with the Southern California Tuskegee Airmen and the historian for that group was, a, she was actually a clerk at Tuskegee Institute when these airmen were being trained as pilots. And she, she was born in 1918 and she and I are still in contact. Um, she has no intentions of going anywhere because she said her work is not done yet. <laughs> She's gotta let more people know what she knows and so she, recently collected all of her papers and the University of California has them now on in their library. And so she was the one who gave me the idea of putting my papers someplace. And I thought, well, who would want my papers? And so Ann Preston said, we do. <laughs> and so we put together this committee that's going to be putting my papers together, but not only my papers, we want to get other papers as well that we can collect for the Carnegie through Brazos Valley Speaks, which is an oral history committee. And that way we can share these papers and photographs and audio tapes and videos and things like that with other groups like um, this group and also the City of College Station, the George Bush Library, and all around. And we're going to be covering the seven county area, the closest ones that border Brazos County. But um, we're gonna be doing videos, documentary film, and things like that. And I, I, I um, have a video that I did for YouTube that was for the Tuskegee Airmen that I'd like to show you now. No U.S. military pilots had been black before the Tuskegee Airmen. Despite the War Department's resistance, in 1941, the United States Congress ordered the U.S. Army Air Corps to establish an all-black combat unit. The War Department responded by initiating a system that accepted only those with a high level of flight experience or college. This policy did not work out as intended. An abundance of applications came from men who had already participated in the civilian pilot training program in which the Tuskegee Institute had participated since 1939. The Tuskegee Airmen were awarded a Distinguished Unit Citation for a mission flown March 24, 1945, escorting B-17 bombers to Berlin, Germany. The Tuskegee Airmen also received several Silver Stars, 150 Distinguished Flying Crosses, 8 Purple Hearts, 14 bronze stars, and 744 air medals. On Thursday, March 29, 2007, the Tuskegee Airmen were honored with the Congressional Gold Medal as America's first African-American military airmen. These are but a few of the Tuskegee Airmen, some of whom were still alive to accept their honor. 
and Macy Harrington was there as well to receive her gold medal for outstanding civilian service during the basic and advanced flying school for Negro Air Corps cadets. And for more than a half century, Macy Harrington has been instrumental in keeping this history alive. These are the kinds of, of um, efforts we're going to be doing for the Brazos Valley. And like you were instructed to do your story, do your story. It's really, really important because so much of American history is under the bed, in a box, in a closet, you know, in an old sewing drawer, in photo albums. Everybody, everybody has history. Even if you don't know what your family's history is, you still have history because you have a neighbor, you have a relative that you might know. You have someone you can talk to about your history. And that's what I did with my grandmother. I didn't know at the time that I was asking her all these questions. I didn't know why I was asking the questions. I was just curious. I was five, six, seven years old. And I asked her things that I had overheard because I always was behind doors and <laughs> around the corner listening to grown people talk. And I'd hear things and I wanted more. I wanted to know more. Um, I actually knew my grandmother's father. I was eight or nine years old when he died. So I had an idea about who she was and what she was about. But I didn't know any of the details. And even when she told me the details, I didn't understand them until much later. She told me that she was a half-blood. And I didn't know what that was. I said, what's that? And she said, well, it means that I have more than half Native American blood. Well, she's Indian blood. And she said, and a lot of people get our people mixed up with Geronimo. And she said, Geronimo was an Apache, and we are Comanches. And I thought, what does that mean? She's, and she said, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> Keep that to yourself. That's a secret. And I said, OK. <laughs> so for years, I went around, you know, and it was a secret. I didn't tell anybody, because she also told me that it was safer when she was growing up, she was born in 1890. When she was growing up, it was safer to be an Indian. That's you know what she called Native Americans. It was safer to be um, safer to be black than to be um, an Indian, a Comanche, especially because Comanches were considered the meanest tribe. They were the last ones to put down the gun, the last ones to stop shooting, and she said it was. Um, customary for Comanche families to melt into the African-American community for, for their own protection. And that's how that family became who they were. And I didn't understand any of that when she was telling me the stories. But as I grew older, I understood, and as I started to delve into the history, to American history, which is not at all what most people think it is. It's so much richer than anything you can read in a history book. When you start digging in those drawers and in those closets and under those beds and you start pulling out those old pictures, those old funeral programs, you've got treasure. And before it's too late, you need to start talking to somebody who can explain it to you. And I am so grateful that, and I didn't know this, I, didn't, I wasn't smart. I was just curious and nosy. But I did find out some very crucial information about my, my family. And trying so hard over a number of years 
to forget about what she told me because I thought, I still thought it was dangerous. I didn't want anybody to know. Um, I just didn't talk about it. I didn't think about it and I didn't write about it until very recently. But I'm so glad I had my grandmother, I had Big Mama to tell me, to fill in all of those blanks that I would not have known about. And you can't possibly have as rich an experience in life if you don't find out as much as you can about your past. And you can't be afraid of it. You gotta just pull that box out and find out what's in it. You gotta tell your story. Just like Linda instructed you to do, get that piece of paper, get that big chief tablet and start writing it down. It does not matter if you're a writer or not. You just write it. You tell what you know about your life and your family, and you will fill in a large part of American history. That's the only way we're gonna get the real story. Because people who just write the textbooks are just writing the facts. They don't have all of that information, that personal information that you have. And we need to share that because we are all closer kin than we think. So that's my story. What's yours? Okay. Anybody got any questions?